So um, I would like to welcome everyone to the October meeting of the Houston Functional Programming User Group. Um, we have with us uh, once again, um, I'm very excited, uh, Richard Feldman, who um, is one of my favorite speakers. Um, he has, I, I've mentioned to a couple of people, I don't think I know anyone beyond Richard who has more enthusiasm for programming. <laughs> uh, he absolutely loves programming and talking about it. And he is just a simply fantastic speaker. Um, so I'm very, very excited to welcome him to our group yet again. And I will turn it over to you, Richard. It's awesome. all yours. Thanks for, thanks for having me again. Um... Uh, so I'm going to share my screen, and uh, hopefully people are going to be able to see it. And all right, everybody see okay? Looks great. I hope so. All right, great. Uh, let me minimize Zoom here. All right, this is the Functional Purity Inference Plan. I'm Richard Feldman. So um, a while back, I uh, gave this talk called Functional Programming for Pragmatists. This was at uh, GoTo Copenhagen a couple years ago. And in this talk, I gave uh, one of my favorite definitions. In fact, this has now become my favorite definition of what a pure function is. So the sort of bland definition is like a pure function is like, okay, you call a function, you give it the same arguments. It's guaranteed to have the same return value if you give it the same arguments. And it's also guaranteed to have no side effects. In other words, it's guaranteed not to affect the outside world like observably in terms of program behavior. They might be doing some memory allocation stuff like that. But in terms of like observable stuff, um, it shouldn't do anything. Um, my favorite definition, though, is pure functions are basically lookup tables. And I got this from Chris Jenkins when we were chatting uh, before that talk. Uh, by the way, shout out to Chris. He hosts the Developer Voices podcast. It's an excellent podcast, which you should check out if you haven't heard of it. Um, and so I gave this example in the talk of uh, a function called string length. And basically, you can think of this as a lookup table. You give it an argument uh, like hi, and it returns two because the length of that is two bytes, um, go to Copenhagen, you know, uh, et cetera. So, you know, essentially the idea is that the body of the function doesn't do anything observable. It doesn't look at any outside state. It doesn't modify any outside state. It's really just essentially a pure function from its arguments to its return value. Um, now, one of the things that I talked about in this talk is how I love having an ecosystem around purely functional programming languages. So I talked about, for example, like if I'm in JavaScript and I'm doing it in a functional style, well, there's all these questions that I have about any given JavaScript function. So let's say that I'm, you know, looking at a, a JavaScript function. I'm like, well, is it possible that this function is like what changed my database in a way that I didn't? Like, what inputs does this function depend on? Does it rely on call order? Um, does it? Could it flake in a test? Can I pre-compute it and cache the value? Can I memoize it? Is it thread safe? Um, and also, even if a function starts out being pure, it can potentially stop being pure if someone changes like one line of code. That suddenly all of these things that I thought were true about it, all these useful properties stop being true. Um, whereas I contrasted this with Elm, which is an ecosystem that I know and love. Um, Elm is a purely functional language. And so all of these questions are just always, I know exactly what the answers are because it's all pure functions. And so they all have all these properties all the time. And the entire ecosystem is that way. So it's just this incredible peace of mind. And it saves me a lot of time, especially when I'm doing things like debugging or even just trying to understand what my code or code that somebody else wrote is doing. So Fast forward a couple of years, um, <laughs> I've been working on this programming language called Rock. Um, Rock's tagline is that it is a fast, friendly, functional language. Um, it's a direct descendant of Elm. Uh, so one of the things that Rock values is much like Elm, it has really fast compile times and we wanna make them even faster actually <laughs> than they already are. Um, and also we really wanted to have a fast runtime performance. That's like a really important value. Like we're trying to compete with like the fastest garbage collected imperative languages in terms of um, runtime performance and also in terms of compile time performance. Um, friendly, both in terms of like the compiler error messages and also the community. I, I think I'm very fortunate to have uh, wound up with a community of people who are awesome and like really nice to each other. Um, that's not a guarantee in every programming language community, but thankfully so far the Rock community has been that way. And I really hope that we manage to keep doing that um, as we grow. Um, and finally, of course, it's a functional language. And today, Rock is a purely functional language. And over the course of this talk, I'm going to talk about a modification to that that we're making. So pure functions, as I mentioned, have lots of great benefits. Um, the problem is that, as everyone knows, most programs need effects to be useful. Now, not all programs, to be fair, like you could have like a theorem prover or something like that, or like the entire program is just spitting out like one answer. Totally fair. But 
vast majority of the programs that get written in the world do all sorts of effects. Notice I said effects and not side effects. So there's a common misconception about purely functional languages, which is that like they can't do any I.O. or anything like that. And then, you know, that's of course not true. Obviously, you can do effects. Um, but purely functional languages typically represent effects as sort of this first class value based thing where you're sort of passing around some sort of value that represents the effects that you want done. And then also like what's going to happen as a consequence of those effects. Um, so this would be like I.O. and Haskell or uh, the task type in Rock. Um, but at the end of the day, if you have a function that doesn't affect when you run it, well, then that's a side effect. And functions that do affect when you call them can't be pure because they're violating that, is it a lookup table thing? It's like running the function itself does actually cause an effect to happen. Now it's no longer a pure function. So often what you see in purely functional languages is that you have sort of a code base that's sort of got this sharp dividing line where there's like two different categorizations of functions. And some of them are pure code where they're like, you know, obviously like you prefer to do it this way where you have like no side effects at all and you have all these really nice properties, but then you end up doing effectful code, you know, whenever it's necessary. Now, this is true of all languages, not just purely functional languages. In practice, most code bases where you have people who are like, hey, I like pure functions. I'm going to try to write pure functions whenever I can. Um, you still end up with some functions that just unavoidably are doing some sort of effect. Now, the reason I'm describing this as effectful code, even in purely functional languages, is that what you end up seeing is that, like in Rock, you see like a function that returns a task. Or in Haskell, you see a function that returns I.O. And yes, technically speaking, that is a pure function in the sense that when you run it, it's going to give you back the same I.O. value or the same task value or whatever every time you call it. But at the end of the day, we know that those tasks are going to evaluate to different things at runtime depending on the state of the world. So it doesn't really have all the characteristics that we care about. Really, the ones that we like are the ones that are not even involved with effects. The ones where they're just like, yeah, I call this function. It does everything that I want it to do. And it gives me an answer. And it has all those benefits that I outlined earlier. So um, in a lot of cases, people like using a functional style, which is sort of nice if you're trying to work with pure functions as much as possible. And so there's been this rise over the past decade of imperative languages that are adding support for a functional style. So they were built as imperative languages. They were not designed with functional programming in mind at the outset. Almost always it was object-oriented programming. Um, and then they've added support for a functional style, or they were just designed to have some functional ideas um, to begin with. So some examples of recently uh, popular languages that have been doing this are Rust, Kotlin, Swift, and TypeScript. Now, granted, even older languages than this um, are also doing it, but these are languages that are relatively speaking compared to things like you know Java, for example. Um, uh, Rust is a, is a good example of this. Um, so this is a language where I have heard people describe Rust as a functional programming language. I personally would not go that far, uh, and I use work. Uh, I use Rust at work every day at Zed. By the way, we're hiring. Um, <laughs> we make an awesome code editor, so also it's free and open source. So if you go to Zed.dev, you can upgrade your code editor to one that's built completely in Rust. Um, but if I'm honest, I don't really use a functional style that much in Rust. Like maybe occasionally I'll do a little bit of like dot map, um, dot flat map, this and that here and there. But it's really kind of sprinkled on. It's not like I'm spending the most time writing functional programming in Rust. Even though when I started learning Rust. That was what I knew best. I knew functional programming. I'd been doing it for like five years. And granted, I had lots of experience in industry before that, before I got into FP, um, doing imperative programming. But when I got to Rust, I was like, I am super comfortable with the functional style. And I tried doing Rust that way. And I was like, this is not, this doesn't feel like functional programming. <laughs> like I like it. Rust feels to me like it's very clearly an imperative language at its core. And yes, there's support for a functional style, but I only use it kind of occasionally when it, it seems like a really nice fit for the problem. Um, by and large, I just default to imperative with Rust and the functional style really feels like kind of an add-in. Um, now TypeScript on the other hand is something where a lot of people will go full bore, let's do it functional first, Granted, again, a language that was not designed with a functional style, but unlike in Rust, I think it's a lot more common to use TypeScript as like a, hey, we do FP style TypeScript here. We don't even try to do imperative TypeScript. Um, so there's this, uh, there's a blog post, or sorry, a, a series of posts um, about uh, functional programming in TypeScript. Um, this is a, a little example from chapter two, and they're talking about a pure function, namely absolute value. Now, granted, you're not really going around implementing absolute value all the time, but let's use it as an example because uh, it's, it's something that everybody knows. So here's the syntax. We have function abs, and then we can see that it takes as one argument, it gets a number, and then in, this is the return type. If you're not familiar with TypeScript syntax, that it also returns a number. Um, numbers in TypeScript, uh, because <laughs> of how JavaScript works, these are 64-bit uh, floating point numbers, aka doubles in a lot of other languages. 
Um, so then the logic is just if n is less than zero, return negative n, otherwise return n, and that's the whole function. So this function is pure, but there's nothing telling me about that from the type signature. Um, I just know that it's pure. How do I know that it's pure? Well, I look at the entire implementation, every single line of it, and I'm like, yes, this is currently pure. And hopefully nobody will ever change that and make it not pure if I want to rely on the assumption that this is pure. Now we can make this a little bit more concise. Um, so you can use a ternary operator if you want. Um, this is like uh, a little bit symbol heavy. I don't personally, I'm not, not a big ternary fan, um, but at the end of the day, if you want to kind of do an expression based, like use more expressions in functional programming type of style, the ternary is kind of the best thing that you get. Um, and of course you can make it even more um, concise if instead of using the function keyword, you do it in a Lambda style. Uh, so this is where you essentially write out a, a closure with this uh, this big arrow like equals greater than, um, and then you can sort of get this down to about as concise as you can possibly get of a one-liner um, for an absolute value implementation in TypeScript. Now uh, in Rock, I'm going to implement this uh, basically exactly one for one translation here. Um, so the first thing is that uh, if you've never seen rock code before, um, we do our type annotations on a separate line. So whereas in TypeScript, this is sort of interwoven where you see like n colon number, and then you say colon number after the whole thing. In rock, we have it on its own standalone line. And part of the reason for that is that as we're gonna see, the type signature in rock is telling you more than the TypeScript type signature is telling you. And so it's actually quite a common thing to talk about functions just in terms of their types without even talking about the implementation because you can get so much out of just talking about the types. Um, this is something that Rock inherits from Elm and Elm from ML before it and <laughs> Haskell and all these other languages. Um, and I, I really like that style. So here's the implementation. Uh, again, it's just a one-liner. So uh, we use backslash because it kind of looks like a Lambda if you squint. Um, and then we say, if N was less than zero, zero uh, then negative N else N. And again, this is uh, just sort of like standard ML family syntax, ML being the programming language, not machine learning. Um, ML from like 1970 something, um, which is what, what Elm and Haskell and OCaml are all descended from and Rock uh, by way of Elm. Um, I do prefer this style a little bit over ternaries just because you don't quite get as much like, you know, the question mark and colon kind of, um, I prefer the then and else. All right, but I said that this, uh, this type is um, doing something uh, it's telling us more than what the TypeScript type is telling us. Um, so we'll get into that in a second. Um, but first I wanna look at a more complicated function. So this is a um, print asterisk function. I got this from a different, I think it was a Python tutorial or something like that, um, where basically it's like, you just give it a range of numbers. Um, so in this case, this would be like one to four stars and it's gonna just print out one star, two stars, three stars, four stars or asterisks. Um, so here's the TypeScript implementation of that. Uh, so we do a for loop, um, or I happen to do a for loop here. <laughs> you get, there's a number of ways you can do it. Um, say const num in range, and then basically for each uh, number inside this range, we're gonna print out um, one star dot repeat uh, for each of those numbers. So uh, the first one is gonna be number one, I'm gonna print out one star, then two stars, three stars, four stars, um, and console.log is how you print those out in TypeScript. So very simple function, just printing these things out. This is obviously not a functional program, um, or, or it's not done in a functional style. Um, this is really, really imperative. This is just like, bam, we're just printing these things out one at a time. But if I'm being honest, I kind of think this is like the obvious way to write this program. Like I love functional programming. I, you know, I, I set out to spend like, you know, multiple decades of my life building a purely functional programming language. But I look at this code and I'm like, yeah, that's a good way to implement this. Like if this is what you want to do, seems pretty reasonable to me, side effects and all. Now, granted, if I have a bigger program, the fact that some of my functions are going to be doing all sorts of side effects, like printing this thing out, um, doesn't make me thrilled. But at the end of the day, if I'm if my only task is to make an implementation of something that takes a number of asterisks for whatever reason and printing it out, this does seem like good code to me. I don't feel like this is this code is lacking in any significant way. Um, now let's make it a little bit more complicated, uh, and let's say that I also want to print out how many total numbers. Sorry, I have. Richard. I, I think there was a question in the chat. Oh, I can't actually see those. All I can see is my screen. Um, um, if you want to. Yeah, so Victor says, um, apologies for the logistics tangent, but to anyone- just trying to get into the venue, it's not a- Oh, 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 oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, 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 yeah, okay. What, should, should I pause? We're Do sending you someone. Let him in? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, we will, let, we will let Victor in. Should I pause or-, or uh... Uh, No, I think you should go ahead. Okay, um, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll restart uh, from the, the, the top of this. Um, just so, so we uh, reestablish context here. So um, so here's a function that's a modification of the previous one that we saw. And essentially what this is doing is just saying, okay, let's also record how many total stars we have printed as we're going along. 
Now, of course, this number can change. Like you could say, I want to derive this, you know, this total printed just from the range, but then you'd have to loop all the way through it twice. So the most efficient way to do it is just every time we are going through um, this, these uh, elements loop, I want to just like add up, you know, keep a running tally of how many things are, um, how many things we, we just printed. Uh, and then at the end, I can return that as the output of the function, having done the side effect of printing out the stars along the way, both of which are separately desirable. So again, not a pure function by any stretch of the imagination, but um, again, I look at this and it's like, you know, I could do this in a more functional style if I wanted to, where I tried to say like, okay, total printed is not going to, you know, get involved in this for loop. It's just going to like be a pure function from range to total number of stars. And that's a reasonable way to do it, at least from a implementation standpoint. But again, from an efficiency standpoint, I'm like, yeah, this is kind of going to be more efficient to just like do it as we're going along. We got the number right there, you know, in memory and just like adding it up. Now, of course, this is the toy example, but the reason I'm bringing up this example is to demonstrate like, I don't think that using an imperative style for some problems is a bad thing. I think some problems are like really well suited to imperative programming. And I'm not saying every problem is, and it really depends on like what type of stuff you're doing, but they exist. And this is one of those examples where I look at this and I'm like, yeah, I could rewrite this in a functional style, but I don't know if it's going to make the code better. Okay. So um, let's say that I wanted to write this in rock today. I wanted to do this print asterisk function translated from TypeScript to rock just using the stuff that we have in rock today. So the first thing I would do is we don't have for loops today. And so I'm going to say, let's um, make a helper function called print asterisk help. This is like a common naming convention in like purely functional languages when you're about to do some recursion. And I want to give it a, a starting um, value of zero here. So here's our, our print asterisk help function. So it takes the count and the total printed, which we're initializing to zero. So first I have to say, okay, go get the length of the range. And then that's going to be the uh, initial count here. So we're going to do our stir dot repeat to, to get our uh, asterisks. Um, echo is, uh, let's assume that's a function that's going to print the string out to the um, console as a side effect. Now, granted today in rock, this you couldn't do that, but <laughs> let's pretend that you could for a second. Um, and then I would recurse. So this is essentially just the like avoiding a for loop part. Um, Yes, you could also uh, write this in other ways. You could write this using like, uh, you know, fold, reduce, walk, whatever you want to call it. Um, but fundamentally, if you want to say this is a language that doesn't have for loops, what's the sort of like hammer that lets you hit every nail the same way that you would hit a for loop? Like any use case that you could use a for loop, recursion will always get you there. But I don't think this code's better. I don't look at this and say like, oh, this, I have now made it functional and therefore I've made it easier to understand what this is doing. In fact, I think this is, it's harder to understand what this is doing. I'm sure there are people out there who look at this and they're like, no, no, this is better, but I'm not one of them. I, I don't look at this and say like, this code has been improved by rewriting it in this style. Um, now let's focus in on this thing that I said, like, okay, this is doing a side effect. So in today's rock, because we don't have any functions like this that are allowed to do side effects, um, what we do instead is, as I mentioned earlier, we have this thing called a task. And task is kind of like a promise. If you're familiar with promises in other languages um, or futures, the difference between task and promise is that Promise is sort of like right when you create the promise, it immediately runs the effect as a side effect, whereas tasks, you have to chain them all together. Um, so you have to say like, you know, the equivalent of like in JavaScript, it would be promise.then. Um, you have to chain all these tasks together and they sort of, the entire program builds up into this giant data structure of nested tasks. And that's how all of the effects sort of get interpreted at runtime. Um, so here's, here's what that would look like. Um, if we didn't have any syntax sugar, and now we're like, okay, if you thought the previous one was like, yeah, no, I thought that code was better. I dare you to look at this code. I shouldn't say that. Somebody's going to take me up on that um, and say like, yes, this code has gotten a lot better. Now, granted, the main reason that this code, I think, looks like harder to understand is you have all these like task.awaits, you know, going on in here. Also, print asterisk help now needs to take this task that it's like accumulating. So we have like task.ok to initialize the zero. And then like, as we go, we're just like awaiting that task. And then we get, okay, the previous like total printed, and then we await the echo. And then we do the, you know, print asterisk help. So yeah, again, I, I, I'm just like, yeah, did, did we did we do a good thing here? Is this is this program that we're trying to build here best expressed in a functional style? Um, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> so here's what we're moving towards. Um, here is the rock code that you will be able to write once we are done landing the changes that I'm about to describe through the rest of the presentation. You can just reach for this if you want to. Um, this is how you would actually implement this in rock. So let's just kind of go line by line here. Um, we have uh, print asterisks has an exclamation point at the end. I'll explain what that means later. That's a, a naming convention. Um, then we have uh, the Lambda. Uh, we have this new keyword called var. Uh, we have total printed with an underscore after it. I'll explain that convention as well. Initialize to zero. We have a pretty normal looking for loop. 
um, for num in range. Uh, we have do instead of curly braces because we kind of just use curly braces for records and not for um, blocks. Um, do is something that Ruby uses for uh, similar stuff. Um, also, the exclamation point is <laughs> similar to, to how Ruby uses exclamation point as a naming convention. Um, this part's the same, you know, repeat the string uh, to, to get the asterisks. Um, we have echo. This actually is doing a side effect. Um, but don't worry, we haven't given up our, our, our value of purity, um, as I'll talk about later. Um, and we're just incrementing total printed in pretty much exactly the same way that the TypeScript code was. So here's the TypeScript code again for reference. Honestly, like, I feel like, A, these are one-to-one -one translations. They're, like, really, really similar. Um, the rock one's actually I think, a little bit nicer. Uh, it's it's a little bit more concise. Um, we don't have like as many curly braces. It's a little less symbol heavy. Um, we don't have semicolons, which, you know, if, if you like Ruby, you might appreciate the lack of semicolons. Granted, in uh, TypeScript, you can omit semicolons. Sometimes, I granted, have not done quite enough like JavaScript to know the rules. All, all that I know is that like you can omit them a lot of the time, but then sometimes you have to not omit them, which I don't know. Personally, I'm just like, I don't want to think about it. I'll just keep them in, even though I like it better if I just like never have to have them. Um, so this is an example of a functional programming language adding support for imperative style if you want to. And the resulting code, at least in this small example, I like better than a language that was designed to be imperative from the get-go. Now, I'm not trying to claim that Rock is now a nicer imperative language than dedicated imperative languages. Um, and in fact, we'll, we'll talk about some ways in which like, much like when you start with an imperative language and add a functional style onto it, the functional experience is just not going to be as good as a dedicated functional first language. The reverse is also true. Like I'm not claiming that Rock is going to be as good at imperative style as imperative first languages, because it's not going to be. And we'll talk about why that is. But of course, if we wanted it to be, we have to give us some of the things that make it so nice with the functional language. And I don't want to do that. So um, so uh, one of the ways in which uh, things are going to change is that there's a very, very subtle difference. If you notice when I add the type signature on here between the type of this print asterisks function and the type of the absolute value function that we saw earlier. So here that is again for reference. So the difference is in this arrow. So what we're introducing is the concept of pure functions and effectful functions as a first class distinction. So a pure function looks the same way that it does today. It has the thin arrow, and then we have the thick arrow for effectful functions. It's not a coincidence that uh, the thick arrow is like the same arrow that you see in TypeScript where, yeah, you don't like none of the functions are pure, um, or, or at least you can't tell from the type. But in Rock, you can. And this is going to be enforced by the compiler. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a work in progress. Uh, August, uh, shout out to August, who's been working on that. Um, I, I saw him on the call earlier. <laughs> I think he's probably still here. Um, he's uh, been doing some awesome work um, getting this working, and it's... Not quite ready to land yet, but um, but that's why the, the title of this talk is The Plan rather than uh, the thing that you can already <laughs> jump in and use. Um, and the basic idea is it's pretty simple. Uh, we just enforce the rules. If you're inside a function and you call an effectful function, guess what? That function now has to be an effectful function because pure functions cannot run effects or else they're not pure anymore. So once again, we still have this sort of uh, you know, the, the dichotomy that you see in practice emerge even in purely functional languages where your code base is separated out into the functions that do effects or like are causing effects to happen, whether or not they're technically pure and the functions that aren't. And we're just reflecting that in the type signature in basically the most minimal way you could possibly do it. Um, so um, let's look at some of the other uh, conventions that we're doing here. So um, one is, so this var keyword, the way that this works is essentially it allows you to reassign a name. So Rock does not allow shadowing. Um, we talked about allowing it, but uh, the, the current plan is not to do it. Whenever you do something like this, um, where you don't have the var keyword, um, that means it's basically the const is sort of implied. So you're not allowed to reassign stir by default. Like you say this, it's as if in TypeScript you had written const stir equals. Um, that's not changing because that's the default. Like normally when you write an assignment, you want it to be const. That's just kind of the, you know, like in a functional style, pretty much what you almost always want. But if you want something to change every iteration of a for loop, then yeah, you actually do want to be able to say, I want to reassign this thing like, like we are here. I want to be able to change this number. And that's what var does. Now, a really important distinction here is that the var keyword allows you to reassign a name. In other words, over the course of this function body, um, I can change what total printed's value is, but it doesn't allow mutating a value in place. Now, the reason this is such a critical distinction is that this means that we still have the property that you can always pass any value you want into any rock function, whether it's pure or effectful, and have the guarantee that that's not going to get mutated out from under you. In other words, if you reference that value again, after you call that function, it will not have changed. There's no chance it will have changed based on what that function did because the language doesn't allow that. So even if you say var whatever, um, 
you, that doesn't allow mutation of, of values. It just allows reassignment of names. So you can reuse this name, you can recycle it, you can change it over the course of this function. Um, also, var does not cross function boundaries. So if I do a lambda somewhere in here um, and I, I've got this thing um, in scope like captured, I can't mutate it or, or change it from within that lambda because then you know that that lambda would be getting getting into territory we don't want to get into. This is really why we're adding this to the language. It's for loops, and then there's uh, one other use case um, which has to do with sort of like a stale state where it was one of the motivations for um, why we were talking about adding shadowing. But this seems like an easier way to do it. Um, also of note, um, using var does not affect a function's purity. Um, like if you wanted to use var inside of abs, that's totally fine because at the end of the day, a function's purity is just about if I call this function with the same arguments, does it return the same value? Whether or not I happen to use var in the implementation of that doesn't really affect that. It's, it's you know, that's, uh, if var worked where it allowed you to mutate what's coming in, that would be a totally different story, but we're not having it have those semantics. This is an example of how Rock is not going to be as good at imperative programming as a, the imperative first language. We have these restrictions on what var can do that most imperative languages, in fact, all imperative languages I can think of just don't have. Um, if you allow uh, this thing to be like reassigned, pretty much every language that allows that um, also allows you know, values to be mutated if you, if you do that. Um, now, one of the things that I really like about where this design is going is that it allows for some really information rich code. Um, there's this really cool book by uh, Edward Tufte um, uh, where he talks about basically like data visualization and one of the things that impressed me about this book was this concept of like, you can have a data visualization where you can learn more and more things and get questions answered just by sort of looking at it longer. You don't actually need it to be interactive in the sense of like, I give it an input and it gives me an answer. You can just answer your own questions just by looking at things. And the code equivalent of this would be, you don't even necessarily need to use your eyes. Um, you, you know, you can use a screen reader or something like that. So um, something that I think is really cool about this is that, Again, you know, just from looking at the type signature, I can tell you this first function is pure and the second function is not. The second function is effectful. Um, and one of the conventions that we are establishing, and this is going to be enforced by the compiler, as in like you get a warning if you don't follow this convention, is that effectful functions end, their names end in an uh, exclamation point. So this is sort of like borrowed from Ruby a little bit. Um, Ruby uses this convention for functions that mutate things in place. Now we don't, that's not a thing that we do, um, but it, the idea here is that basically now, if every function that's effectual has an exclamation point in its name, then check it out. I can tell you very quickly, like, oh, even if I don't know the type of this function, I can just look at the body and be like, look, there it is, there's the effect. And that's the only effect that this function does. I can see that really quickly. Um, I was writing some code uh, that was for a web server that was sort of being done like, let's pretend that this style already exists and I can do it, uh, even though like it hasn't landed yet. How would that code look? And there was this cool moment where I was implementing a function. It was for um, reading the uh, access token out of the headers of the web request. And I realized um, that there was only one exclamation point in that function. And it was for getting the current time because essentially I just needed to see if the token had expired. And I was like, ah, I'm so close. Like this, this is almost a pure function except for this one thing, which is getting the time. If I just accept the current time as a parameter, then now this whole function, like all the stuff that it's doing to get the like, you know, JWT out of the header, this can be a pure function. And it's like really easy to test. It's it's never gonna flake. I'm never gonna get like, oh, this test passes except like, you know, at midnight on like January 1st when like, oh no, you know, like that that type of stuff that, that can happen when you have tests that are depending on the current system time um, or, or like, you know, trying to hard code it. Like now it's just passed in. And it's like, it's trivial to test that function. And the only reason that I realized that it was so close to being a pure function was that I was like, oh, this thing has an exclamation point in there, which means I need to put it in the name. I was like, mm, do I do? Like, maybe I can just make it be a pure function and just like kind of move that exclamation point out a little bit. Now, this is the thing that a lot of people I've talked to have said like, yeah, I do that habitually. And I do too, granted, like when I'm writing Rust code at Z or what, you know, when I, before I was um, using functional programming languages, when I was doing uh, functional style like JavaScript and CoffeeScript back in the day, um, I would do that as much as I could. But it's not quite the same as like when you actually have compiler assistance where you actually have like, no, this is a rule. Like it, fe it felt different even in that moment when I didn't actually have a compiler doing it and I was kind of like faking it myself. It was a cool moment. I hope to get more cool moments like that. Um, Okay, um, and, and by the way, today there's already an equivalent of that, which is like, if you have a function that returns a task and you're like really close to not needing that, it's always like, oh, let me, let me see if I can get that task out of there, <laughs> if I can avoid it. Um, so I think this is a, a kind of a lightweight, or, uh, lightweight version of that feeling. 
Um, also, I can tell more things, keeping on the theme of like information richness, I can look at this stir dot repeat and be like, hey, this doesn't end an exclamation point. That's a pure function. Again, I don't need to go look up its type. I'm just looking at the code on my screen right now, or you know, getting it out of a screen reader, and I'm like, I already know that this is not a, you know, if I'm wondering what effects does this function do, it's like, it's only the ones that end in an exclamation point. I can tell that just at a glance, literally, I don't have to ask any questions. I don't have to stop, go like press some IDE buttons. It's like, just from looking at the code, I can tell that. Um, speaking of which, let me get back to that um, underscore naming convention for vars. So the idea here is that vars have to be named. And again, this is also enforced with a warning um, with an underscore at the end. Uh, so the reason for that convention is uh, well, A, to make them stand out. So you can say like, this is being reassigned and I'll explain what the value of that is in a sec. Um, the reason for an underscore at the end is that it's supposed to mirror the underscore at the beginning, which is the convention that we use for like, hey, this is unused, but like, you know, don't warn me about it. Like if you get an unused warning, you can just stick an underscore at the front, which means like, yeah, yeah, I know it's unused, but like, don't don't yell at me about it. I, I, I still want to give it a, you know, a meaningful name so I can tell what's unused. Um, so the idea is that underscore at the front means unused and underscore at the end means reused. So um, when I look at this code and I see at the end here, like let's pretend this code was like very, very long. This function was long, like, you know, multiple screens. I can tell just from looking at any instance of this, this thing is being modified somewhere in the function, like earlier on. Whatever this thing started out as, it got changed somewhere in here. And I can tell that because again, if I if, if that weren't the case, the compiler would have warned me about it. First of all, if it didn't change, it would say, you don't need to use var for this, so get rid of the var. Um, <laughs> um, so basically, like I can tell from looking at this for sure, this thing is um, changing, and I need to be a little bit more careful about it. So in this particular function, um, the way that that's changing is like, oh yeah, it's in in the body of the loop. And, you know, it's it's being incremented. Um, here, plus equals would just be sugar for like equals total printed plus one, um, just like it is in most most languages. Um, now the the critical thing here about this is that um, in pure functions, effect order doesn't matter. Um, and what I mean by that, or sorry, uh, um, ordering of uh, code doesn't matter. Like if you're calling pure functions in like, like first I call this one, then I call this one, then I call this one, I can shuffle those around. As long as they're getting the same arguments, like it doesn't matter, nothing happens. And the same thing is also true of constants um, that are never being reassigned. Like it doesn't matter if I you know, put it up here or down there or, or whatever else, as long as the constant is like being computed the same way, really doesn't matter. Not true if we are reassigning things. As soon as we're reassigning things, that code is just less portable. I cannot cut it you know, from one part of my function and move it up to another part of the function because I think the function will read better that way. That might actually change what the code does, even if all the same stuff is in scope. Um, I've actually had this happen to me in Rust code where I've moved stuff around. That's a refactor I used to do in Elm almost without thinking. Um, and just be like, oh yeah, I think it'll be you know more logical, more easier, you know, easier to read what I'm doing if this thing goes up here. And then the code breaks. I'm like, ah, what? How could that happen? And it's because Rust allows doing stuff like this. So the idea of the underscore is to give you a warning, like, hey, this code is not portable. Um, you cannot like, <laughs> like portable in terms of like where it is in the code base. You can't just like move it around willy nilly because it's potentially going to change its semantics if you do that. And again, this is not the default because the default is like you have constants. So the constants don't need to do that. It's just when you're opting into var like this. Um, okay, so, um, Here's our uh, our print asterisk function again. Um, now, one of the things I could do is I could say, okay, let's let's forget about the name for a sec. So, you know, print asterisk exclamation point equals. We'll just get rid of that part. Um, I can look at this function and infer like, okay, that's the um, th this is a uh, an effectful function just by by looking at that. So, even though I don't have the type, even though I don't have the name, I can just you know at a glance look at the body and very quickly answer the question, you know, is this uh, pure or not? Um, and also, again, at a glance, I can look at this underscore and say this chunk of code within the function is um, is not portable. Um, one case where this came up that was actually really cool was I was looking at uh, Brendan Hansconnect's um, uh, code for uh, Rocky Bird. So if you haven't played this, it's a, it's a really cool game. Um, it's got some sweet art. Uh, so this is sort of like a, it's based on this uh, platform called um, WASM4, which is uh, like a web assembly platform for um, uh, building like sort of old school style games in the browser. And Rocky Bird um, is implemented in Rock. And I was looking at this code and there's a bunch of code here, like there's all sorts of stuff. If you want to look at the full source code, you can um, look at this uh, GitHub repo up top. And I was reading through this code, just kind of skimming it. And I wasn't like looking at, you know, every single thing that it was doing. Uh, but I did see one thing that really kind of stood out at me, um, that, that uh, jumped out at me. So like at first I was like, okay, so it's like, you know, drawing the pipes and that's like, okay, effectful, exclamation point, cool, makes sense. Um, drawing the ground, drawing the plants, got it, that all makes sense. 
going through like, oh, we're calculating Y pixel here. Um, and then I got to this part and this is what jumped out at me. Player collided and then I give it the Y pixel and then the, you know, the flap animation and player collided has an exclamation point, like the collision detection function. I was like, huh, why would player collided be effectful? Like what, why would it need to like read from the outside world or write to the outside world? So I dug into it and I looked at the implementation and I came across this. So here's the implementation and it says, there's a comment at the top. This is written in a kind of silly but simple way. Um, Cause let's be honest, this is a side project. This is not like a production you know, game that's like shipping to, you know, to, to be sold for money. It's like, it's a hobby project. Um, it checks to ensure a few points in the sprite are all background colored. This must be run before drawing the player. And then there's some other stuff happens. Then we iterate over the pixels. And then basically at the very end, you see, okay, why doesn't four dot get pixel? And this is the part that's effectful. In the entire collision detection logic, this is the only part that's effectful. And the reason that it's there is because essentially what this is doing is saying, okay, Wasm4 already knows how to like draw these pixels for the bird, like, you know, into the, the sort of the background buffer. And it already accounts for like buffer, you know, background transparency and whatnot. And so the basic idea is just to be like, okay, let's see what the how the pixels ended up. If the pixel ended up being the background color, then okay, we didn't collide with anything, great. Um, and if we did uh, collide with something, then the pixel would not be the background color. And it's just sort of leaning on the, the underlying sort of game engine um, to be able to answer this question rather than trying to write a really complicated, like, okay, let's let's go through and look at every pixel in the bird to see if it, you know, really, um, you know, carefully collided. Because if you just basic like rectangle based collision detection in a game like this, you're going to be really frustrated because, you know, the corner of the bird that doesn't exist is going to clip the thing and you're going to lose. And you're going to be like, what? Come on. Like, it, I, I clearly did not hit that. But, you know, um, so you want to be precise on those things. And this is a reasonable way to do that. The point of this is that if I hadn't read every single line of code of this, like in most languages, that exclamation point would not have had to be there. I would have had basically like no idea that this code has to be run before drawing the player or the collision detection doesn't work because it relies on the drawing actually having already happened in order to get that pixel. Now, this is, I think, given the constraints of the project, namely, again, it's a hobby project, this is a totally reasonable thing to do. But I have worked at all sorts of places and worked on all sorts of code bases where there are things like this. There's some sort of little gotcha and if you don't happen to read every single line of code and find the one comment that describes the gotcha, you just trip over it. And you know, if somebody else wrote it, maybe they don't even work at the company anymore. Um, I see these things cause production bugs all the time. And what helped me figure out that this was happening and led me straight to this was just curiosity about like, hey, how come there's an exclamation point there? And to me, again, this is awesome. This is such a great like outcome here because it's just one character. It's, it's a little exclamation point. It doesn't make the code like really cluttered up or, you know, harder to understand what's going on. But it gave me this really important clue of like a little thread to pull on. And when I pulled on that thread, I actually found something that was really important and helped me understand how if I wanted to make changes to this program, I could do so without accidentally causing bugs. That's exactly the type of thing that I'm hopeful that will be able to become part of the rock experience. It's like you look at code like this, it's really easy to follow. It's very concise. The effect handling is very straightforward. And yet you have all this sort of information richness of looking at the code and being able to get these little insights very, very cheaply and very, very quickly, honestly, without even thinking about it. Okay. So um, we talked earlier about there's imperative languages that are adding support for functional style, like Rust, Kotlin, Swift, and TypeScript. So Richard, well, I want to interrupt. There are a few questions in the chat. Okay. So um, one uh, is um, if the exclamation mark and, and the underscore are are good indications and compiler enforced, do we still need the the uh, thick arrow and the var keyword? Hmm. Uh, totally valid question. Uh, well, okay, so those are separate questions. So one was, um, do we need the thick arrow and do we, do we need the var keyword? Was that the two questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So. Um, let me back up and see if I can, I, I'm not sure if these happen to have examples of this, but we'll figure it out. So one thing is, um, actually, no, okay. I know I can find, yeah, here we go, cool. So one of the things that I like about this is, I mentioned this earlier, but um, I'll reiterate it. So a thing that we do like in Elm and also in Rock is like quite often, we just talk about functions by talking about their signature um, because the, the signature tells us a lot. Um, the thing that I like about having it explicitly in the arrow is that I don't need to look at the name. I don't need to look at the implementation. I can just be like, hey, suppose I have a function with this type. I don't need to tell you its name. I don't need to tell you its implementation. 
we can just have a conversation about this and about the differences between this. And I think that's especially nice when you're talking about like API differences, like, hey, I got this function and it's like this. Um, what if I made it be like this instead? It's like, well, hang on. You'd have to change the thin arrow to the thick arrow if you wanted to do that, because you know that's going to introduce effects. Oh yeah, you're right, you're right, right, right. I love being able to talk about those things and not get bogged down into questions like, what am I going to name the thing and things like that. So it is a small distinction. Like, um, you know, there is a world where you could say like, we don't have that distinction um, between the two, um, but I think we'd be missing out on something. Um, and and one other example of this, and, and this is something that. Um, comes up often in uh, in <laughs> in uh, language design conversations is like, what happens when you put it into the REPL? So if I put into the REPL, I say like, you know, here's a Lambda, it does, it calls an effectful uh, function. Um, what is the type of that that comes out? Cause it's an anonymous function. Like I didn't, you know, say anything about its, uh, its effectiveness or not. It, the REPL is not gonna choose a name for it. It's just gonna be like, hey, this is an anonymous function. Um, I would like the REPL to tell me like, hey, by the way, this is an effectual function that you just pasted in here. That's useful information for me because um, I, you know, if it was a long one, for example, I might not have noticed that there was an exclamation point in there, and then I wouldn't have had the name to tell me. Um, so, you know, not a hard requirement, but I think it's worth it. Um, uh, the so, question. So, was, oh, go ahead. Push, push back on, on that a little bit. Um, push back. Okay. Um, certainly, in in um, pure functional programming languages, looking at the type signature gives you a ton, and, and, and often. Right, if it's just end to end, then uh, who knows what you know. But but it, it can often give you a whole lot of information. Here, having the thick arrow, I'm interpreting this as well. I have this type, I have that type, and in between, anything can happen. So is it telling me that much? Okay, so here's the, here's the question. I don't know if you've done Haskell or so how much Haskell you've done, but what's the difference between saying F64, thin arrow F64, and in Haskell saying F64, thin arrow IO F64. To me, that's basically the same thing as thick arrow. Um, any case where you have like in Haskell or an element would be task or rocket would be task today, um, where you're saying this function returns an IO of this or a task of this, it's kind of the same thing. It's, it's really saying like, yes, I'm gonna give you this task value but as soon as this task value gets turned into the value that it wraps, which is what I really care about, all bets are off. It could be doing any number of all sorts of things. Now, granted, there are type systems that make that more granular, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about later. Um, but uh, but at a basic level, I don't personally think, at least based on my experiences using Haskell and Elm and, and today's Rock, that there's a significant difference in terms of like how much the type signature is telling me between this returns an IO of F64, a task of F64, and Thick arrow, which is saying like I'm going to do some side effects and then give you an U U64. Because at the end of the day, like that's in in both cases in practice, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Right. Second question was about var. Um. So the reason for the var keyword is to prevent mistakes of like uh the like copy pasting variety. So imagine that I have this code where I um, let's pretend there's no var, var keyword for a second. It's just total printed underscore equals zero, and then inside here I'm doing total printed. Um, underscore plus equals one. Now you can imagine that let's say we had some like really big code and there was you know a lot of stuff going on and I copy paste some code from somewhere else um, into the middle of that code. And just by sheer coincidence, I happen to use the same name of this variable that's in the outer scope and being used. So total printed, okay, that's not that likely to happen, but you could imagine, I don't know, count underscore something like that, something sort of generic. Um, well, now what I've accidentally done is that I pasted this code in there, which used to just declare this local little variable and then modify it. And now I'm accidentally modifying the outer variable. So this is a problem that used to come up in CoffeeScript all the time, um, where uh, CoffeeScript basically didn't have a var, like they just, all, all the assignments looked like this, but um, <laughs> they, uh, they, they, they were mutable. So you could like reassign them all the time. Um, the purpose of var is that because we don't allow shadowing is if you do this and then you paste some nested code that declares var with the same name again, you'll get a compiler error instead of it silently messing everything up. Um, so that's the reason that we have that keyword in addition to the convention of the underscore. Great questions. <laughs> um, other, other questions before we uh, move on? Okay. Uh, I do have a question. Oh, sure. Uh, is the underscore enforced by the compiler in some way? Or yeah, so the idea is that if you if you use the var keyword, um, then the compiler will say like, hey, you're supposed to name this an underscore at the end. So, you know, please do that. Um, just a warning, like it's not, uh, 
you know, it's not gonna like block you from running the program if you if you don't do that. But um, yeah, both the underscore at the end and the exclamation point at the end, uh, the plan is to have those be compiler warnings. So everybody follows a consistent style. Oh, nice. What, nice. One more question quickly. Um, yes. If a var is only declared locally and used locally, can the outer function be considered pure? Yes, absolutely. Um, so purity is really just about like what happens when you, uh, right. yeah, like get the arguments and then return it. So yeah, like there's no, um, that doesn't really affect that. Uh, it, it could if we had var have different semantics where it allowed um, in place mutation, but it doesn't. So yeah. Yeah, so it happens to be used in an effectful function here, but you could totally use var in a pure function be totally fine. Um, doesn't affect that. Cool. Um, okay, so uh, so previously we were talking about um, uh, how there's a lot of imperative languages with support for functional style. We talked about Rust, Kotlin, Swift, um, and of course TypeScript um, as examples of imperative languages that support a functional style. Um, so the idea here is that basically we want to take Rock and make it be a functional language that is functional first and like has awesome support for functional programming, but also it does have support for an imperative style when you want to reach for that. Now, granted, like an imperative language is not going to make you add these underscores. It's not going to make you name things on the exclamation point. Var is going to you know work across function boundaries. Um, you, know, you can mutate stuff in place. I'm not saying that Rock you know has the best imperative experience in the world, but rather that we want to let you use an imperative style occasionally when that seems like genuinely the best way to write the code. Um, much like how you know I when I'm you know writing Rust and said most of the time I'm writing an imperative style. But sometimes I occasionally will say, you know what? I think this code right here would be best in a functional style and I can just reach for that. That's the idea here. Um, but there's another piece to this, which is learning curve. One of the things that's really cool about for loops that I, I took a long time to realize, um, but I was talking to somebody who teaches um, a lot of beginners uh, about like how to do both imperative and functional programming. And one of the things that came up in that conversation was about sort of how useful for loops are um, and uh, <laughs> reassignable variables for that matter as a beginner, because if you know how to do reassignable variables and you know how to do loops, you can unblock yourself to do an enormous number of things. You can just figure it out on your own. You can solve all sorts of problems. You don't need to necessarily know like special purpose functions for that. Now, the problem with learning a purely functional programming language, and I have seen this in, in, in practice, is that at first you're like, okay, I learned about like list.map and maybe like, you know, like it's like map, filter, it's a couple of, you know, small ones like that. You can maybe like more advanced ones like concat map, flat map, you know, that, that, that type of stuff. But there's a pretty long list of like increasingly special purpose niche higher order functions that advanced users get familiar with and, you know, know to reach for. But as a beginner, you don't know what those are. And so if you're, if it doesn't happen to like map directly to like the, the couple of uh, higher order functions that you know about, then you're at this sort of awkward point where you're like, okay, uh, I have this problem. I don't know how to solve it using the primitives that I'm aware of, or like the helper functions I'm aware of, how do I solve it? And then your answers are, well, the most flexible way to solve this is either recursion or the most general of higher order functions, which is either you know fold or reduce or some variation of that. And the problem with that is that for loops are notoriously easy to learn. Recursion is notoriously difficult to learn. So having recursion be the answer for, hey, this is your all purpose, get out of jail free card, you can solve whatever problem you want, isn't that great? Especially when you're like, and also by the way, you got to make it tail recursive. And now I got to teach you what that is and how to, and you know, <laughs> follow the rules for that. If you don't want it to potentially blow the stack, if it's like, you know, getting too big, which maybe as a beginner, you know, might not come up. Um, I have actually blown the stack on like some beginner exercises before, but, uh, but the point is that once you get past the very, very basics of functional programming of like, you know, map and filter and whatnot, once you want to unblock a beginner to be like, hey, you can now go solve your own problems, a lot of problems. For loops are awesome for that. Recursion is not awesome for that. Fold is not awesome for that. Like fold is a higher order function that a lot of people, even after they're like intermediate functional programmers, are like, hang on, I got to go look up what all these arguments do. And I know there's like something I could use for this. And then, oh, wait, but I, if I need to exit early, then like, what, what do I do? And then like, if I, there's just all of these layers of difficulty and like stumbling blocks for beginners to trip over that just do not exist if you have a for loop in the language. And much like with Elm, you know, Rock does aspire to be a language that is beginner friendly. It's not our number one value, but it's important to us. And so to me, it matters that people can get into Rock and start using it in an imperative style and be like, hey, I'm just gonna write this type of code all the time as if it were Go or TypeScript or something like that. And over time, I can learn, oh, 
if I do things in this other style, if I do a pipeline of like, you know, operations, my code gets more concise and it gets easier to understand what's going on. And I don't have all these underscores, <laughs> you know, as often. Underscore becomes a rare thing rather than a constant thing in my code base. Um, I have fewer exclamation points in my code base. And part of the reason I think that can be an awesome experience is that that was how I got into Rust was at first, I didn't really understand all this like advanced borrow checker lifetime stuff. Um, this is another thing that's notorious, like functional programming, purely functional programming is notorious for having basic things like loops that don't happen to fit into the, like, you know, the map filter um, type of space being harder uh, for beginners to pick up. Rust has a reputation, I think well-deserved for being hard to get into when it comes to the borrow checker and lifetimes and stuff like that. But there's this escape hatch, which is in Rust, it's called dot clone. <laughs> and a whole lot of borrow checker errors get like, just go away. The compiler leaves you alone if you say dot clone. Now, you know, when you're doing dot clone that you're not doing the best thing here because that deeply clones the thing and it's bad for performance. And very often if you're using Rust, it's because you want performance. So the dot clone is sort of like, I wish I could get rid of that. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But the point is as a beginner, you have this thing where you're like, I know I'm not quite doing the thing that like this language is built to do, but it's okay, I'm, I'm unblocking myself. And as I get better, I will trust that over time, I will learn how to use clone less and less. I think we can do the same thing here. And we can say like, look, you're starting out doing things in an imperative style because we support that. But over time, you're gonna learn the functional idioms and you can sort of ease into it. And my hope is that this will give beginners a smoother experience overall than what's possible today. Because today, once you get to that point, it's sort of like, all right, you just got a cliff that you got to climb down and you can, or climb up. Um, you got to learn these things in order to get yourself unblocked. You got to become comfortable with recursion right now before you can continue working on your, you know, hobby project game or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think that's awesome. Um, and I think like putting these things together, like uh, it's, it unlocks a new learning experience that I'm really excited about. Um, okay. I do want to mention some other alternative designs that we considered. Um, I, I referenced this a little bit earlier on, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because honestly, that could be like a whole hour to itself. And I, you know, I, I want to wrap up here. Um, but basically, um, so uh, here's like a really, really simple example of some rock code that you'll be able to write once all this lands. So you say echo, hi, um, stir equals read arg. So this is doing an effect, like reading it from who knows, environment variable, whatever. And then like uh, echo out the string that you just read. Okay. Um, it, like the very beginning of Rock, when we had no syntax sugar for any of this, um, this would all be done with tasks. So this is like the, I don't think, again, anybody would look at this and be like, oh yeah, this is much better code than that. I mean, maybe they would, but I don't I don't think so. I think it reads a lot you know, nicer in that style. Um, the first version of this that we had, uh, which you know obviously was something we considered because this is what we started with, was what's called backpassing. So this was Rock code that you could write. Um, actually, this still compiles today. We haven't, uh, we've deprecated it. Oh wait, maybe I think we just landed a PR to remove it. I forget. At any rate. Backpassing is deprecated, but um, well, I think it's still just deprecated. So you get a compiler warning if you do this today, but it'll still compile. Um, so basically the idea here, which I thought was really cool at the time, um, was uh, basically it's sort of like a backwards lambda. So if you look, you see the same kind of ingredients here. So you have like this, here's this lambda that corresponds to this. And then the entire body of that lambda is like over here kind of. Um, and this is like, you know, calling it, passing this whole lambda as its third argument. Um, and it's the same thing down here. Again, you have like stir in the arrow going this way. You have stir in the arrow going that way. And then this is the body. This is the body. So it's like, yeah, it's a backwards lambda. Cool, right? Apparently it's cooler in my mind than it is to a lot of beginners. Um, <laughs> so back when this was like the way of doing things, we tried it this way, by the way, and then also tried it um, this other way where uh, we had it sort of like um, with the arrow on the other side. Neither uh, like like piping it to tasks out of weight. Neither of these like worked out great in terms of beginners. Um, a lot of people were just like really confused about it. It was like one of our more common beginner questions of people being like, I, I don't understand what this is doing. Like helping be like, oh, look, no, like it just desurgers to this. I think part of the problem is it's like you explain what it desugars to. And it's like, this doesn't look great. Like this isn't like innately, you know, it's like, oh no, it just desugars to this, right? This is really straightforward. Yeah, not when you're used to this. <laughs> um, so um, another version of this is uh, what Gleam does, uh, which we did talk about. We never actually implemented, um, which is essentially like um, taking this backpassing thing. And then uh, instead of having each of these um, calling the tasks out of weight, you sort of do this um, use at the top where you say like, okay, just implicitly each of these arrows is going to be connected by a task out of weight. That's totally a thing that you can do. Um, and I have heard people say that they like enjoy that feature in Gleam. I think it, it it is relevant to note though that Gleam doesn't do this for IO. 
Um, Glean does, or at least, uh, okay, not normally. I guess if you're compiling to JavaScript, you might use it for promises in Glean. I don't know how the experience is there. But I think in Glean, this is used more for things like parsers. And granted, that is the selling point of this, is that you can use it for other things than just I.O. because it's just syntax sugar. Um, but at the end of the day, I also have heard a couple of people say that like they found that, or, or that like beginners find this confusing in Glean sometimes. But I think it's pretty different if it's like, this is blocking you from doing I.O. in the language versus like, this is something that you as an advanced user can potentially um, reach for. Um, regardless, um, we tried this out for IO and it, it didn't go great. And then finally you have um, Haskell, which is basically like a more concise version of what Gleam does. Again, this is more powerful. Haskell's is based on monads and like you can, you can do all sorts of things with it. Um, but at the end of the day, like fundamentally, um, these are all kind of like, you know, several sides of the same coin. Um, oh, we also, by the way, on, on current Rock, uh, we, we do have this version, which is, uh, Slightly different than this, where um, exclamation point is actually currently a keyword, and we do this sort of elaborate desugaring <laughs> into this down here, um, which in terms of like code readability, I think has gone pretty well. But again, we have seen beginners talk about like, as soon as you start trying to explain the sugar, which ends up being unfortunately necessary in a lot of cases, because if you don't have a good mental model of the sugar, I was hopeful that it was like, ah, you don't need to worry about it. But it turns out that it's like, most of the time you don't need to worry about it. But then occasionally you get a really confusing compiler error message. And then again, we just start busting out the sugar explanations. So I, I'm really looking forward to a world where we can just have really straightforward compiler error messages that are just like, you're calling an effectual function inside a pure function. You can't do that um, without, without changing this to be an effectual function. That's like so straightforward and easy to understand. It's just going to eliminate this whole category of confusing compiler error messages, which beginners run into all the time right now. Um, so these are alternative designs that we all sort of like considered. Oh yeah, one more thing about the like, the whole family of like um, chaining functions, like task chaining, uh, like, you know, do or use or backpassing or whatever else, um, is that there's certain things that they just like can't do. Um, so the classic example of this is like, if you wanna do an effect inside a conditional, you just cannot do that at all in the chaining style. You have to name the thing and say like, you know, does this file exist equals or, or you know, arrow, um, and then say, if does file exist then. Uh, there's no way to just like run this in the middle of this. And you can, like you can't do something exactly like this. You could do the like task that await manually yourself. Um, but again, like these types of things where you're doing nesting or especially putting them inside conditionals, which granted doesn't come up all the time, um, but like, it's just like, it's not possible um, unless you're doing something like, you know, this style and not using that um, chaining syntax. So, um, Basically to summarize, like, you know, why not changing syntax? It's like, there's this learning curve of backpassing or use or do that like just does not exist um, in, in the direction we're going. Like that learning curve just is completely obliterated. It's just gone. Um, the learning curve of like uh, task itself, by the way, is also separately a concern. Um, so there's been this ongoing question that we've seen of like, hey, I've been chaining all my tasks together. We've been accumulating these errors. Like Rock is pretty awesome at that actually. Um, but now I'm like, hey, I don't want to run my task. I want to just like, get the error and like handle the error. Like, how do I do that? And that's a totally reasonable question, but then we're like, okay, now you got to convert from a task to a result. And like, here's how you can do that. And now you need to kind of like move your code around a little bit. In the world where we have purity inference um, and we just have like a distinction between pure and effectual functions, it's like, just call the function. It's just going to return a result, which is like a totally normal thing that you can pattern match on. It's like a completely ordinary value. Um, my hope is that that will just become like a non-question because like, again, this, this category of learning curve just goes away. Um, there's nothing to convert between. Um, also, there's some um, performance overhead to these like um, task containers. I'm not really talking so much here about um, like the cost of the like data structure itself, but rather the way that things have to be organized inside of it. Um, so we have a little proof of concept of um, stackful coroutines, um, which is kind of like what Go does. Uh, also, Brendan Hans Connect, uh, uh, who I mentioned earlier with uh, Rocky Bird, like he and Luke Boswell um, collaborated on that, and uh, Brendan's been working on. Um, this like really awesome uh, like implementation proof of concept of, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's really awesome. It's awesome that he's working on this, this <laughs> proof of concept that um, is apparently close to working um, where basically we can get um, sort of performance characteristics or, or like doing things in the same style that Go does for like really, really high performance, low overhead concurrency. Um, uh, as soon as I say that, I guess people are immediately gonna ask about the beam <laughs> because the beam also does some like related stuff where it's like, you know, actors versus channels and there's like different semantics. Um, you could use what we're building to build something more beam-like, but the beam does way more than just that. So uh, that's like kind of a whole rabbit hole. But the point is that trying to do that today where we have um, this task-based thing, you can't really do something like that. Um, there's other things that you can do. And so there's a, there's a possibility that we might want to explore um, offering a behind the scenes mode where you can sort of 
compile down to something that looks more like tasks because then you can hook into other languages async runtimes like rusts or um, node.js's but uh, that's again sort of out of scope for this talk um, and finally, uh, I mentioned earlier, like error message helpfulness. Like, I think it's just going to be way more straightforward error messages um, compared to like today with all the syntax sugar that we're trying to do to like approximate this. Um, one of the things that we've learned from doing that is just that like, yeah, the error messages are not great and maybe we can make them better. Um, but it seems like a lot more straightforward and simple to just say like, what if we just didn't have that category of errors anymore? Um, and we just <laughs> had essentially the same like uh, error message experience that you get when like not doing IO in the language, which is much better, I think. Um, uh, I also mentioned earlier, and I'm just going to briefly sort of gloss through this. Um, there's a there's a much broader algebraic effects design space. Um, we talked about all these things, and the short version of this is like we're just kind of aiming for something simple and minimal right now because we can always add more stuff later, but it's much harder to subtract stuff after you've added it. Um, so we're just going for the most minimal implementation of this right now, which is sort of like binary algebraic effects. So this is an algebraic effects system that we're talking about here, but it's like the most simple, minimal one you can possibly have. It's just binary. It's like are you a pure function or not? That's it. <laughs> um, whereas like, uh, you know, you have like OCaml and Unison, I would say, or, or, and Coca would be the like top three, like most well-developed algebraic effect systems that I'm aware of. Um, so they'll have things like effect polymorphism for higher order functions. So you can say like, I'm going to call like list.map. And if I pass it a pure function, then it, it, it is a pure function. And if I pass it an effectful function, then now it is an effectful function. Um, at least for this design, like we're not getting into that. Um, you know, the, the door is always open. We can like, you know, talk about it later. But at least for right now, for the the what we're planning on shipping as the like the first iteration of this, um, we're not going to get into that at all. Um, also, um, OCaml and, uh, and Unison and Coca uh, will track which effects the function does. So you can have in the type signature things like. Um, not only is this an effectful function, but I will tell you that this effectful function is doing HTTP and file IO. Um, but it's it's not you know doing this like uh, like like writing to standard out or something like that and you can tell that at the type now there's there's trade offs there we used to have a sim um, a similar system to that where we had task with a third type parameter that tracked like which effects were happening it got kind of verbose um, I wasn't a big fan of it I was like I actually think it would be better if we stopped doing that um, so I am. I think there are like pros and cons to doing that, um, but it's not like a clear like, oh, this is just better. And it's like, yeah, the drawback is actually pretty serious. I think in terms of like how verbose your type signatures can get if you're like actually just need to do several different effects and then that it has to propagate to every you know, function that calls it. Um, but regardless, again, this is something we could add in the future if we want to on top of the system. Um, and finally, um, customizing how effects run in user space. This is usually called algebraic effect handlers. Again, not something that we're doing for this iteration, but the door is always open if we want to, like any of these things, we, we could expand from what we're doing now to these things in the future. Um, but for right now, it's going to keep it nice and simple and minimal and just try to get the, what I see is like sort of the, the main benefit, which is just this like really clear separation between like here are pure functions, they have these properties that we can rely on, and here are effectful functions, they have a different set of properties. Okay, and finally, before I wrap up, I just wanna acknowledge that like, hey, this is adding new language primitives. Um, one of the things that I value about a language is like, I appreciate a small set of simple primitives as like the basis for the language. Um, Elm's logo is a tangram, which is like a small set of like uh, shapes that you can make a surprisingly many things from. Rock's logo is an origami bird for the same reason, because it's, it's a, this idea that you have this like small set of simple primitives. You have a piece of paper and some like folds that you do on it. Also like, you know, folds are a thing in functional programming. Um, but like, I appreciate that. And this is definitely adding some more primitives to the language. Um, but I think it's important that A, these primitives are pretty simple and easy to learn, like famously so. It's not like var is like a famous stumbling point for people or for, for that matter. Um, the exclamation point, like thin arrow versus thick arrow. I think all of those are like, pretty straightforward. And I think overall, this is going to make the learning curve for the language less. Um, so even though it is adding more language primitives, I think overall, it'll make the language feel easier to get into than it is today. Um, so overall, I just think the benefits seem to outweigh those costs, but I am acknowledging like this is definitely a cost in my mind. Like all else being equal, I prefer a language, a, a smaller set of simple primitives, but this is a case where it seems like the benefits are so big that it outweighs that value that I also have. Okay, so let's talk about a lot of stuff. Um, let me just summarize it real quick. Um, so here's the you know purity inference plan. Again, this is like the plan, but we have not yet shipped it. Um, so you cannot try it out yet. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, pure functions have thin arrow in their types. Effectful functions have thick arrow in their types, um, and they have names ending in exclamation point. The compiler enforces that with a warning. Um, 
If anything is mislabeled as pure effectful and its implementation isn't, then it will um, give you a warning about that. And that's whether or not you have the type annotation or not. It's all done with type inference. So it knows whether it's pure or effectful, even if you didn't label it as such. Um, again, uh, var also not yet shipped. Um, the idea is that, you know, just like today, constants are defined just using uh, equals. There's nothing changes about that. Um, variables are defined using var, and also by conventions they're named in an underscore. That's also enforced by a compiler warning. Um, variables can be reassigned, which constants cannot, but all values are still immutable. So if you pass a value into a function and then you reference it later on, the function will not mutate it. Um, you know, the, it, it will be completely unobservable. Um, like, like <laughs> you don't have to worry about things changing out from under you. Um, loops and early exits, um, while loops uh, work on booleans. For loops, we work on iterators. I'm not going to talk about iterators. That's kind of out of scope for this. Um, that's something that doesn't exist today, but we have a, a design proposal for how those can work. Um, I didn't mention these explicitly, but just to note, um, we're also going to add return, um, which doesn't work the way it works in Haskell. It works the way it does in imperative languages, uh, which is to say, exit the current function early, including if you're in the middle of a loop. Um, I can see an argument for adding like break and continue. I don't think that's like a critical, you know, oh, we must do it or we must not do it for this proposal. So kind of like not really planning to ship it or not yet, but like it seems like not that controversial to do it, but um, we'll, we'll talk about it like we do it, we'll talk about everything um, before considering whether to add something like that. Um, okay, so um, basically, I mean, I, I guess if I could summarize everything that we talked about, it's like rock, you know, fast, friendly, functional language. Really the only thing that's changing is that instead of it being a purely functional language, it's gonna become a purity inference language. That's is the functional purity inference plan. Thanks very much. All right, thank you so much. This was this was so, so interesting. Um, Great. So <laughs> already a number of questions in the chat. Um, I guess I'll just ask, um, just lost our lights here, that's okay. Um, if anyone has like a question that they're just dying to ask, just unmute yourself and ask, or if there's someone uh, here at Pros who has a question that they're dying to ask, and, and, and then we can go through the chat. Uh, I have one question. Are, are Can bars be captured in the environment in a function closure? And you said that um, vars, if you if you pass them to another function, they're sort of passed by values. Does that mean that they're also captured by value? Great question. So, um, the like implementation work on var hasn't even started yet. Um, I'm I'm of two minds, and we haven't decided. Obviously, we have to decide before we implement it one way or the other. The critical thing to me is that it's so you write a lambda, it captures the var. That lambda is not allowed to change the var. Hundred percent. There's no chance that's we're going to ship that. There are two possible ways we could enforce that. One is we could just give you an error and say like, hey, you're not allowed to capture vars. So if you want to do that, you need to like name a constant <laughs> equal to that. And then you can capture the constant. And now it's extremely clear like, oh, okay, this is a constant. I know that I'm capturing a constant, whatever. That could turn out to be annoying, in which case we could say like, okay, as a convenience for you, we will just like whatever the value of that var was right when you made the Lambda, that's what you're going to have captured, that immutable you know, sort of snapshot of it. Um, but I can see an argument for that being like, although it's more convenient, maybe it's more confusing too. That's why I'm a little bit unsure about it. If I had to guess, I would guess that we would start with the error one just because it's strictly easier to implement. And then you know, just be like, hey, you can't do this. Um, and then like, if people complain about it, then we'll be like, okay, let's let's consider like doing the, the like less explicit, but also less annoying thing. I don't know if it's going to come up that often though, to be honest. Um, well, that's like another thing I'm not sure of, but either way, the critical thing to me is that like, we don't allow, uh, mutating it inside because that seems like, um, yeah, that, that opens a, a door that has a lot of implications that, um, I don't want to get into, at least not right now. Like maybe, so, maybe someone could convince me that it's uh, like a good idea someday, but, uh, at least for right now, I, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> and I guess if you're, if you're not mutating, inside the the lambdas that also means that this doesn't mess with the stack allocation of the closures that you have right yeah um that doesn't i don't think uh get changed at all um cool. yeah that sounds great other questions um go ahead go ahead Oh, I do have a question, but it's a little bit outside of the presentation, I guess. Uh, 
uh, I do understand that Rock uh, has this property called platforms, where yes. basically I can attach a platform that may be like a web server or that may be a game engine or that may be like a driver I can access to. But I, I wanted to understand if those platforms are necessarily tied to some kind of FFI or like an interface to like a library or a system outside of Rock, or is it just Rock by itself? Uh, it's the first thing. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> didn't want to make this talk any longer than it was, so I kind of intentionally excluded a lot of <laughs> Rock features. But very briefly, um, so the idea behind platforms is that you build your Rock application. That application is always built on one particular platform. You have to pick which platform you want. Um, and the platform has two pieces. One piece is the Rock API. So that's what, as an application author, that's what you deal with. Um, and the other part is what we call the host, which is the low-level implementation. So Rock platforms always have a host that's implemented in not Rock, um, and that's critical. Um, so the lower level thing is like the the current most popular two that people use are um, Rust and Zig, um, but you could do it in like whatever language you want. And um, we've had proof of concepts in like Swift, like any language that basically like has like a CFFI, because um, that's like what the application compiles down to is something that's compatible with the um, C ABI. Uh, basically, like you, you can use it for that. Um, so. I think you may, may have actually had, I remember you mentioned earlier that um, you work at Airline Solutions and you uh, you, you, you like uh, Gleam and, um, and Elixir. And uh, so I think we have in the repo, there might be a proof of concept of somebody um, like calling rock code on the beam, um, which oh, wow. I think nice. you um, Yeah, because right, you, have, you have CFFI. So basically you can use that as the platform and just expose some like beam primitives to like call rock code um, from the beam if you want. Um, I don't really know enough about the beam to know like how, like what the trade-offs are, if, like if that's a like, Thing that is like awesome or not um but of course like gleam is like already a first class like functional language on the beam so it's like <laughs> uh, do you need another one um but uh, a first class typed functional language on the beam I, and elixir is becoming one so um but anyway um yeah that's uh hopefully that answers the question <laughs> uh and just follow-up question is there a way to track that you're using a platform or is just that like embedded in your environment uh you mean like which platform you're using? So, so every Rock application has to choose a platform. You can't, there's no such thing as like a Rock. Oh, you cannot like combine different platforms together. Right. So that's a really common okay. question. But yeah, I mean, without going into the like rabbit hole of explaining why that is, um, yeah, it's, it's always exactly one platform. No more, no fewer. <laughs> okay, got it. Thank you. Sure. Um, I see some questions in the chat uh, that are marked like sort of for later. Uh, let's see. Um. Uh, if not mentioned um, at the end, if exclamation point, oh, okay. So we did, we did talk about that. Um, let's see, uh, effectful functions aren't actually required to produce side effects. Um, yeah, they are. So, so if you, if you want to have a function that does side effects, it has to be marked as effectful. And there's like literally no way that you can, uh, do that without the compiler yelling at you, I guess. I shouldn't say that. Like my, my question was actually the opposite. Like, can you mark it as effectful, but it doesn't actually have an effect? I see. So the current plan is to um, is to give you a compiler warning if you uh, if you do that. <laughs> um, I, basically, because like I would hope that like you would just like want to know if you're like, oh, this used to be effectful, and I got rid of the last effect, and it's like. I would want the compiler to tell me like, oh, I can make this a pure function now, and then like, so in the future, um, without again going on a, on a huge tangent. There are a number of compiler optimizations that we want to do that only work for pure functions or are only safe to do for pure functions. Um, and so like being able to have the compiler know that something is pure or not like becomes a pretty significant like uh, you know benefit. <laughs> Hopefully it will um, uh, if, it, if it actually is pure. So yeah, um, I guess there's a world where we could say like, hey, it can know that it's pure even if you annotate it as effectful because it can look at the implementation and like figure that out and ignore your annotation. But I don't know if we'd want to like do that. The type system complexity required to have it have like the real version and the like the version that you said it was like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but anyway, the plan is to be like, yeah, let's just like give you a warning if it's if it's uh, inaccurate. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, ba -ba -bum. Ah, uh, question for you. Do you have an intuition for when FP versus imperative styles are more appropriate? That's a great question. Um, so certainly I would say that if you have a problem where um, there's a lot of unavoidable like state changes uh, in a loop, especially, 
that's the case where like whenever I insist on doing things in a pure functional style, I'm just sort of like, I don't love how this code turned out. I kind of wish I had a for loop. That that's the category of things where I've found myself being like, I really wish Rock had loops, and now it will. Um, but like, I mean, basically, I guess it's like when I find myself either reaching for recursion and being like, okay, I have to be really careful to make this tail recursive so that it compiles to a loop. It's like, I'd just rather have a loop. <laughs> like in general, whenever I'm finding myself like being really careful about tail uh, tail call optimization, uh, making sure that it, it triggers, then I'm like, yeah, this, this code would be nicer. That's maybe my biggest heuristic um, for that. But again, like not something that comes up often, but um, but it does occasionally come up. So, so, so let me follow up on that then. It, it sounds like for you, it's more in writing the code rather than sort of thinking about the problem. Uh, well, it's more about, honestly, it's more about reading the code, I think. Um, like when I read other people's like recursive functions, like wh whether it's like writing it myself or or reading other people's, um, like I, I often find myself like mentally translating it to like, so what's like in like loop terms, like what's this actually doing? And that helps me like understand it better. Um, and anytime I have that like, as a heuristic of like, okay, I need to like, in order to understand this, I have to mentally desugar it. Um, that's always a red flag for me that like, mm, maybe, maybe this isn't the right way to write this code. And uh, another example of this is um, a controversial functional programming opinion that I have is that uh, like the point free style is like kind of a mistake, um, just like in general. I, I, I started off being like, oh, this is awesome. And then I was like, well, okay, maybe I went overboard. Maybe I should only try to do this sometimes. And now I've gone all the way to the other side of like, just never do it. Um, and the reason that I, I kind of came to this conclusion was basically just realizing how much time I was spending looking at this thing and being like, I'm sure there's a smarter, better Haskeller out there who looks at this and knows immediately what it does. But for me, I just need to, I just kind of need to desugar this either in my head or even like write it out to understand what it's actually doing. And then eventually like I got better and better at this and I was like, I still need to desugar this manually. Like, what, why am I doing this to myself? Just, just write the desugared version in the first place. Like, what, what, who, who is this better for? Um, I don't. I'm not actually. I mean, I'll take them at their word that they exist. People who look at the like really ultra compact, like you know, function composition on the fly um, version. And they're like, I get it immediately. And this is amazing. But I don't know. It's not for me. I, I just think it's like, <laughs> it's like a waste of time. Um, and similarly, I'm like, yeah. Sometimes I think like the the loop version is best. But, but. But not all that often. It's it's really pretty rare that it comes up. So that's why I want to have support for it, but not have it be like the the thing that's most natural and ergonomic to reach for. Hence the like underscore and things like that. I, I think that's interesting. Um, not to belabor this too much, but often um, and certainly sort of in FP circles, there are these sort of um, I don't uh, maxims of like oh use the right paradigm for the problem at hand. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why I'm asking this question is we, mm -hmm. this is super interesting to me that it, it's it's what it sounds like is it's when reading the code that you're like, oh, this is the wrong paradigm for this problem. It's not like, oh, I've got this problem. I know the right paradigm. That That's what I've always, and, and it's always made me feel kind of stupid that, <laughs> that I could be like, well, should I do that imperative or should I do that in FP? And, yeah. And, this makes a lot more sense what you're saying to me. And I think it also, it, that can happen at different levels of granularity. So for example, I can have a code base where I'm like, overall, I want this whole code base to be in like a functional language because that's the main style I'm going to use like almost all the time. But I, I think I will appreciate having access to the imperative style occasionally. But also the reverse has been true. Like I think if I'm writing a super performance critical application, like, FP does a lot of tricks and is like doing a lot of stuff that's like not exactly what the hardware wants to do in a lot of cases. We do our best to like, you know, have Rock try to do what the hardware wants to do a lot of the time. But like the, the main example I think of is like um, structive arrays versus array of structs. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. There's like the data oriented design is sort of like the buzzword version of that. But like this is something that we're increasingly doing in the Rock compiler. And I just don't think it's like that innately compatible with the functional style unless we tried to like make it an optimization that happens behind the scenes. But like, man, there's there's so many things that we're doing in the Rock compiler, which is written in Rust that are just like very imperative in a lot of cases, like memory unsafe, which is also not something I want in my functional language. Um, but it's okay because for that use use case, I'm like, it's fine. We can we can do a very imperative style of compiler for a functional language because I super care about the performance of that compiler much more than I care about doing it in the style that, you know, um, that I like to use for like application development of like web apps and stuff. Um, 
but so yeah, I think I think it can happen at like a small granularity of like individual functions or even parts of individual functions, and also at the entire like language level. Um, I don't think there's like a yeah, I don't have like a grand unifying theory of like when to use one or the other though. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, you want to go through the chat or you want me to try to find? Yeah, something? let me look at some more um, things in the chat. Uh, so yeah, there was a question from Michelle. Oh, um, okay, very quickly, let's go through the chat and then our tradition in, in this group is that then we stop the recording and then we can have additional conversation that will not show up sure. on the recording if, if, if you really want to push Richard on something. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Save it for um, at, after we stop the recording. Yes. Uh, so Michelle's question was, um, when you describe uh, trying variations of the code with beginners, does beginners mean people who are already comfortable with programming or people new to programming? I mean already comfortable um, with programming. So I... Um, I don't really have any firsthand experience like teaching people to, okay, I've taught like two people to code ever. Um, I don't consider myself knowledgeable enough about what people who are new to programming like want and value to like really know how to optimize for that use case. And honestly, I'm not sure if like, if Rock is like, is or isn't a, a great language for like people who are new to programming. It's not really something that I'm like aiming for, but like if I could have some confidence that like there are some things we could do for that, I would consider it. Um, an example of this is I looked at, uh, the um, uh, Quorum programming language, which is actually designed for like people who are brand new to programming and like uh, does a lot of like, they, they have the rule that you're not allowed to make a change to the language unless you've done a p published peer reviewed study demonstrating that it's more effective for like beginners or something like that. Um, it's really interesting. So they found things like um, rather than like, you know, a print um, uh, for like printing out to the screen, it's like the terms like output and input apparently are like beginners like pick up on um, more, more quickly and easily. Um, but Again, like that's not really like what I'm necessarily trying to optimize for. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm like aware of that, but that's not really. Uh, yeah, the, the the goal is like people who are already familiar with some programming language. Um, uh, let's see. As a team user for a while now, anyone found any annoying foot gun issues with the design yet? And is pending a solution or is the happy final design? I mean, um, there's trade offs all over the place. Uh, like we we talked about a lot of different variations of this this is the the like the current thing that we're like yeah this seems like the way to go um the thing that we actually spent the most time about and had the most unsureness uncertainty about is something that um i didn't actually put in the presentation which actually has more to do with like uh error handling and like early returns of that um so we settled on an operator called try or like a keyword called try which basically means like take this uh result um i'm not gonna give it the result type but basically it's like if it's an error, then like early return the error. It's like syntax sugar for that. Um, and if it's not an error, then just like unwrap the okay. Um, so Zig has something that's a keyword called try that works almost exactly the same way. Um, that's like the one thing that we're sort of like, this seems like the best option, but we talked about a lot of alternatives and that's kind of the one that won out, but like not by a wide margin. Um, but yeah. Uh, Claude asked about, um, like to hear more about user testing of these different approaches. Yeah, I mean, it's really just kind of like, we talked about it a lot in Zulip. Um, and like, you know, we went through, like I wrote several design documents and like went through several iterations of those design documents. And just the whole process was really just sort of like, let's look at like made up code samples. Like, what does it look like if we do it this style versus that style? Um, and uh, at the end of the day, like, you know, we're not gonna like go out and be like, let's use your test this on people. Um, we're just gonna try it <laughs> because uh, this is a, a pre, it's not only a pre, 1.0 language, it's a pre-0.1 language. We actually don't formally have a version number um, yet for Rock. It's all nightly builds. <laughs> um, and part of the reason for that, and in fact, the main reason for that is just to set the expectation of like, hey, we're changing stuff. Um, so like, you know, please don't don't you know be surprised if things change. Um, this is the biggest change I think we've ever made to the language, even though weirdly, if you look at a lot of the code today, it's actually not going to look that different um, because we currently have the exclamation point operator um, that's just going to become uh, n no longer <laughs> semantic and, and instead a naming convention. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, certainly like uh, I, I I don't have any like, I, I can't point to data that says like this is better. It's really just about like, we talked about it a lot and we're, this seems like it's going to be a, a pretty awesome change. Um, Okay, uh, error message, yes. That's August, by the way, who uh, in the chat, who uh, implemented uh, the uh, purity inference. Um, uh, also, Luke is here. Luke is also awesome and has done a, a bunch of stuff, um, not directly related to this necessarily, but um, Luke is like one of the most active and awesome contributors to Rock. So <laughs> thanks to Luke. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, why convention? Because yeah, it's like, it's the compiler, it's just a warning. Like the compiler is not going to block you. Um, um, 
yeah so it's like warning being like on the same level as like you know unused variable it's like it's it's gonna be like okay you know uh, you keep going um cool um oh yeah yeah there's a question about like uh do warnings block it getting to production yes so if there are any compiler warnings the compiler will still work and do its job but it will exit with a non-zero exit code so the idea is that like warnings automatically fail ci um uh, like if you have like a, a CI server that, that builds it, um, but uh, they, they, you know, again, won't block your development uh, if you're in the middle of working on something. Uh, cool. Okay. I think that's all the questions. Yeah. I think that's everything in the chat. Um, so I, I, I just um, want to, uh, the last chat message, I just want to read out loud because it, it, it definitely echoes what I'm feeling. Um, I love this strategy of FP language copying the imperative language playbook of implementing imperative features. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's super, it, yeah, th th this is, this is so great. Um, so I want to thank you. Um, we're going to turn off the recording and then we can continue our discussion for a little bit longer. Um, but thank you so much, Richard. This was, this was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Now I just have to find how to turn off the recording. All right. No, yeah.